Hello, and thanks so much for checking out the Coin Stories podcast on YouTube. I'm Natalie Brunel, and I'm excited to share my guest this week is the incredibly brilliant Lynn Alden. Lynn is an investor and independent financial analyst who has been performing investment research for more than 15 years. She founded Lynn Alden Investment Strategy in 2016, and she examines advanced topics for institutional investors, but also breaks those topics down for retail investors to understand what's going on in global macro. She is bullish on Bitcoin, and her goal overall is to help people build wealth and financial freedom, and she has a fascinating backstory on what inspired her to make smart decisions about money. She is the first of hopefully many female Bitcoiners on Coin Stories. Here's Lynn. Okay, well, Lynn, thank you so much for joining me. I'm so excited to talk to you, and you're actually the first woman on my podcast, so welcome. Happy to talk, and there's plenty more I can recommend if you want to have more on. I can't wait. That's my goal is to get more women into the Bitcoin space. So I want to start at the very beginning, and you know, I read one of your blog posts about your childhood, and it was just fascinating. Um, I couldn't find where you were actually from, where you were born, um, but I, I know that you were homeless for a period of time when you would have been in elementary school, right? Um, so talk to me a little bit about where you're from and, and your childhood. Yeah, I'm from the Philadelphia area. Uh, and so, you know, when I was like four or five, I, I did experience homelessness for a while. And that lasted for a couple of years, few years. Uh, and it, it took a couple of different forms. I mean, we were in homeless shelters. Uh, and at the worst point, we were living in a car. Uh, and that's, you know, there, there's a whole backstory there. I mean, you know, separating, separated parents, some substance abuse issues, things like that. But eventually I, I, I transferred custody over to my father uh, and grew up in a trailer park. So that was a step up from being homeless. We at least ha had a stable environment. Uh, and so, you know, from a young age, I just got into saving and investing pretty early. Uh, and it just combined with the fact that I had a knack towards quantitative things, so math, science, money type money type of uh, things. And so that, that's kind of how I started. And ever since then, I've, I've just kind of ramped that up over time. Yeah, I saw you got pretty personal in that blog post. I mean, are you able to share anything more? I read that um, you said your mom had a really high income and had like a sports car, and then suddenly things went sour and your dad was sort of different. He was always really big on saving, but um, he didn't invest, right? He had a lot of money in cash. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, they kind of both had two different halves of the situation. So my mother, uh, she went into law, right? So she had a, a very high income. She was doing well. Uh, you know, she had a very interesting background. She traveled uh, when she was very young. Uh, and, back, and back then, I mean, she was, uh, like, women in law school were pretty uncommon. So she was actually one of the, one of the, the very few in her school. Uh, and so, you know, she went through that process, but eventually, I don't want to go too much into her story, but, you know, that, that, that broke down and, and uh, so that, that had a very different outcome and she didn't really have savings. Uh, and so that, that went off course, uh, but you know, she's, she's a very good person. And so, and so she just had those difficulties in her life. Uh, whereas my father was a, a, the opposite scenario where uh, he didn't complete high school. He eventually got an equivalent uh, certification. Uh, he became a police officer. Uh, and then he eventually, uh, his second career was in um, like uh, alcohol recovery. Like he was uh, working at a facility that, um, you know, would help people recover. Uh, and so he always had kind of the, the, the you know, working class salary, middle class salary. Uh, and, you know, he never really saved and, he, you know, he never really built wealth, but he had, for example, a pension from his, from his police officer days. He always had enough money on hand to pay whatever would happen. He always had some savings, in other words, but he didn't, he didn't really say, you know, put aside $10,000 a year and invest it and compound that over time. And so, you know, he found himself often kind of constrained in some ways, but it was overall, a, you know, a more responsible situation. Yeah, no, I saw that he, he had like a really great credit score. And I think a lot of people are in that boat where they have a lot of money that they're putting away just in the bank, but they're not really, you know, capitalizing on making returns and investing because I think people don't know even where to start. Um, the other thing I thought was interesting is that you talked a lot about how really being in that forced simplicity of living in homelessness has really informed, you know, how you view the world and how you view money. So um, when you were homeless, I mean, at that young age, did you start to realize that, hey, I don't want this to be my future. I want to make sure that I'm financially secure. Did you get curious about money? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it took, it's probably right after that period. So during, during the experience, I was still pretty young and obviously I didn't want that, that approach anymore, but it was more about day to day, you know, focusing day to day. Um, and I would still, you know, partially go to school sometimes, right? So we, we kind of would rotate, uh, move around, and I would I would attend some school for a few weeks, and then we'd move again. And so, 
uh, you know, it's kind of a challenging environment. And I was mostly just trying to do what, what kids do and kind of like, you know, find friends to play with and, and read books and things like that. Uh, but a, it was kind of after I, I got out of that situation, uh, you know, by the time I was like, say, seven, eight, uh, that's when I kind of, you know, got into that mindset of like, okay, I want to definitely do better than this. I want to have, you know, uh, I want to basically have that security, that stability and, and grow things over time. And so when I, you know, learned the math of exponential compounding, uh, and so I just kind of started that, that path from there. And a lot of it was just realizing that you can be happy without spending a ton of money uh, on material goods. And so that, that stuck with me all through, all through, you know, growing up in a trailer park, going to college, uh, then graduating a student debt and, and, and getting my own place. And it was all this process of, you know, finding ways to be happy that don't require a lot of money. So being in, you know, exercising, eating right, uh, you know, engaging in hobbies that you find enjoyable. Um, uh, you know, even do even hobbies that can make you money, right? Instead of costing you money. Uh, and so I built that up over time. And eventually, I mean, as my income grew, uh, you know, I, I would, ex, you know, uh, increase the expenses, but at a, at a slower rate than the income going up. And so basically that, that gap that could be, you know, put towards savings and investing, uh, that still kept growing. When you see the problem of homelessness kind of balloon here in this country, I live in Los Angeles and it's something that I cover a lot for my news job. Um, do you look at it a different way? Um, and, and has your experience being homeless really made you feel like you want people to understand um, that there are a lot of stories out there? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people that work in finance, they, they often come from a decent background. And so it, it, that kind of problem can feel detached for them. Whereas I feel like I have a foot in both camps uh, because, you know, uh, you know, right now I'm, I'm very well off, but of course I came from that earlier background. And so I have that experience. And so a lot of what I focus on is kind of the, say, some of the policy issues that, that maybe led to some of this rising homelessness. So, you know, the, the you know, rapidly increasing, say, housing costs uh, combined with the fact that, say, the United States has the highest uh, per capita health care expense in the world, even though our outcomes are not really better than, than most other developed countries, especially for, you know, the lower half of the population. Uh, and so, you know, we have these kind of structural issues uh, that I think have been building for several decades, and it's really starting to manifest in the past five, 10 years in a more visible way. Uh, and I, it, it's, you know, I think it's it's becoming harder for society to ignore, especially since the great financial crisis that in many ways a lot of people didn't recover from. Yeah, I think that's fascinating that not a lot of people look at it from that the, the fiat trickle down and how that impacts things like homelessness. Um, but I read that you started investing at just 16 years old. Warren Buffett was like an idol to you. And it seems like you read a ton of investment books. You were like a Matilda for the finance world when you were young. So, I mean, how did that happen? How did you start investing at 16? Yeah, so start a little bit before that because I started with saving cash. And then I my first investment was in uh, coins, so, so gold and silver coins. And so I had an uncle that had this like box of like foreign coins and they were like the cheap kind, but I was like, oh, that's a coin from Egypt or that's a coin from, uh, you know, Turkey or that's a coin from, you know, France. And I thought it was really neat. And so I started collecting coins and then eventually, uh, you know, for, for like, uh, you know, hot for like Christmas and things like that, I would get say silver coins. I eventually bought some like, you know, very small gold coins. And of course, back then that was the late nineties, early two thousands. And so, uh, you know, it was much cheaper back then, right? So gold was only a few hundred dollars an ounce rather than, you know, 1800 an ounce, whatever it is today. Uh, and so I, I, I kind of started uh, building that collection. Uh, and then eventually, you know, by the time I was a teenager, I was like, okay, I want to move into equities now. Uh, and so I would, I would, you know, read, uh, you know, by, by then the internet, uh, you know, was, was, you know, more commonplace, right? Because it was, it was like the late nineties, early two thousands. Uh, and so, uh, I basically just read all these different investing websites, uh, learned about, say, value investing, right? So learning, you know, instead of just seeing a stock as a, a price that goes up and down, it's like, okay, there's actually a company behind this business. You can an analyze it with price to earnings ratios or price to book ratios. You can see what the growth is doing. You can look at the balance sheet. Uh, and I kind of look, looked into the whole process of, say, someone having a more contrarian mindset, like, say, Warren Buffett will you know, buy something after it's, after it's gotten cheaper, whenever, when everyone else is selling it, uh, he'd go in and buy it. And so, for example, I kind of had that intuition earlier on where, you know, I was, I was in, I was maybe, how old was I? I was like 14 when the, the dot-com bubble was like unwinding, depending on what year you look at it. And my dad sold all his investments and said, yeah, the stock market's uh, casino, I'm getting out. 
And I was kind of like, this is the, this is like the better, oh, this yeah. is when you buy this is, and I, I didn't really know what I was doing, but I was like, it goes up and down. Here's like a 30 year chart. And like, it just went down a lot. Why would you sell now? And, but I didn't really have the sophistication to analyze it in more detail, but eventually I, I built that up over time by, you know, having access to all the, the free resources that were on the internet at the time. And that, you know, have, are even bigger today. Well, this is so fascinating because I would expect you to have studied, you know, finance or economics, but I saw you went to Penn State and did electrical engineering. So how did that happen? I mean, part of it was just in school, I always liked science and math uh, quite a bit. Uh, and the engineering side just appealed to me more in a practical sense. I mean, you could, you know, you could get a good salary right out of a four-year degree. Uh, and, you know, I didn't really want to move to New York, for example. I didn't want to have the investment banker lifestyle. Uh, and so I, I pursued engineering, uh, but at the same time, you know, I, I still kept investing on the side. Uh, while I was in college, I would, I would, you know, I had a little investing blog that I would do uh, and things like that. And so I, I still kind of kept up that, you know, experience on the side while also moving into, you know, studying technology, studying engineering. And then eventually, I eventually merged them together a little bit more with my master's degree because I focused on engineering management that you know, had you know, courses on financial modeling, ec engineering economics, the account discounted cash flow analysis. And so you know, I started my career as an engineer, but I eventually shifted more into managing the finances of an engineering facility uh, and, and basically engineering management type of thing. So I, I kind of pulled those two forks back together eventually. Yeah, I think that's interesting because it reminds me a little bit of Saifedean's background as well, where it's that intersection of money or finance as well as engineering. So you can kind of break things down. Did that help you with just understanding things like financial models? Because you're almost, it's almost like you're predicting the future. And a lot of this is based on people's emotions, right? Yeah, I mean, well, valuations are, are in part based on people's emotions. But for example, or, uh, company earnings are are based on, on fundamentals. Yeah. And so, you know, you can't say, okay, this, this stock, this this price, this stock is trading at a 15 price to earnings ratio. And I think two years from now, I'll be trading at a 25 price to earnings ratio that that involves, you know, technical analysis or basically analyzing sentiment. Uh, whereas what I'm doing is saying, you know, this stock is historically cheap. Uh, it's, it's got a good discounted cash flow model. I think that the earnings are going to go up by this much in a range over the next five years. And therefore I'm investing in it. And so I can't tell you exactly what that price will be, but I, you know, I, I, you know, going back to the break, the, the idea of breaking it down into small pieces, I'll say, okay, what is top line revenue going to do? And you just kind of work your way down to the, the bottom line. And then you apply the valuation layer. You, you also look at global macro. What are the big headwinds or tailwinds that might affect it? Uh, and so I, I do find that the engineering approach of kind of, you know, taking complex system, breaking mm -hmm. it down into subsystems, understanding them individually, and then putting them back together is really helpful in finance, whether it's a, a specific company or whether it's, it's analyzing some macro situation. This is also fascinating. I just want to hear you talk for hours because I want to absorb your knowledge. Um, so talk to me about your early 20s. When you uh, left school, what were your first jobs? Because I know you kind of projected your future income. And then, of course, life happens, right? Some unexpected things happened in your in your 20s. I know um, I think you had maybe some health issues and medical bills that came up and someone passed away. So what were your 20s like? Yeah, so basically that was, I was working as a, an engineer, electrical engineer, uh, yeah, and so I enjoyed my job, um, but yeah, I started to run into, you know, headwinds, and I said, okay, I'm going to budget this much, here's my income, uh, I knew from my organization roughly what I could make in, say, three or five years if I do well, like, I was like, okay, when, it, when I'm a mid-level engineer and a senior engineer, I can make these salaries, uh, and so I kind of projected out, you know, how, how I would, say, build wealth or build savings, uh, and that was on track for a while, but then I, I ran into some headwinds because uh, my father died, uh, so that was an issue. Uh, and then my, my mom also, uh, you know, she started requiring financial support. So there's this, there's this kind of, you know, this, this, this uh, you know, notion today that millennials are like living in their parents' basements. And, and whereas I, I was kind of the other way around, where I was, you know, supporting a parent rather than having a parent support me. So I've been, I've been on my own financially since I was 18 or so. Uh, and then by that point, it was actually even more than on my own. It was also, you know, supporting someone else. Uh, and so, and, and then, yeah, I had health issues that weren't fully covered by insurance. And, and so, you know, because, you know, insurance, depending on what plan you have, can only cover so much sometimes and you start to, to ha you know, have to pay out of pocket. Uh, and so, you know, that those were setbacks for someone that, you know, when I, when I graduated college, for example, I had assets because I hadn't been investing, uh, but I also had student debt. And so I actually had a negative net worth. And so, you know, I had to build up from that hole. So I would, you know, I'd, I would channel money into paying that off. I would channel money into assets. Uh, and so 
you know, I ran into some headwinds, but eventually I got back on track uh, and, and eventually blew past my expectations, uh, you know, by, you know, going into financial research and basically always having a side hustle, always having extra ways of earning income rather than just relying on the job and kind of sticking to that 40 hour work week, right? So instead I would go and say work 60 hours a week uh, and basically learn more and, and produce more so that I could accelerate that, that kind of starting phase. On a personal level, how did you deal with some of like the pressure or the stress? Because I mean, your situation, it sounds like there's just almost this this fear to not end up back on the streets. I mean, but some people would just break down and feel like, you know, maybe they would get depressed or they would turn to something like substances or something just to make them feel like they can cope. How did you get by when things were rough and you had all this pressure to support your family and to, to make money when you were just, you were financially independent and you were so young? Well, I was fortunate enough to have a steady job. And so that, that certainly helped keep stress low. I would say that, I mean, there, there were periods that were more stressful than others. And so for example, in college, when the, when the, uh, you know, the financial crisis was happening when I was in college, and so it's kind of like, okay, I've, I have negative net worth and like, it'll be, it'll be hard to find a job uh, after this. Uh, and so one of my internships, I had a great internship and I was going to go back the next year, but it got canceled because all their internship, all their interns got, got canceled because the company was just trying to stay solvent. Uh, and so they're trying to keep their permanent employees. Uh, and so for example, you know, there's headwinds like that. And I was kind of like, that was kind of the peak feeling of instability when you have negative net worth, you know, yeah. very little income, I, you know, I had a part-time job. Uh, and so, but once I started, uh, you know, having an income, uh, you know, decreasing liabilities, increasing the assets, uh, I did have savings pretty early on at that point. And so, you know, it was one of those things where I had a lot of stressors, but at the same time, I could go, I could go 12 to 18 months without a job if I needed to, because wow. I had a lot of investments saved up by that point. Uh, and so, you know, when there were headwinds, you know, they were certainly stress points, but because I, I still kept making progress in most years, you know, it wasn't as stressful as it, as it could have been. It wasn't as stressful, say, my mom experienced when, when you know, sh she was having that difficult phase in her life or as, as stressful as, as other people experience. And I mean, you know, people have different life experiences. So someone have, who has kids early, for example, and then find themselves in financial stress, uh, you know, they, that's a whole nother layer that they, they go through. Whereas for me, it was, you know, uh, more like supporting a parent, which in some ways is, is less stressful than, than say, supporting kids when you're uh, financially unstable. Sure. Do you remember some of your early investments, like maybe one on the positive end where you were like, wow, I struck big. And then maybe another where you totally, you know, made the wrong bet and lost a lot. So my first stock I ever bought was Adobe. And that's both a good thing and a bad thing, because obviously Adobe did extremely well. Uh, but the funny thing is I sold it too early. Uh, and, and so I eventually bought it back later and then wrote it up like a, for like another like double or triple. But like there like it, it would have been like, say, a 20 fold increase from when I bought it, you know, back in the, in the early 2000s after the dot com bubble. Uh, and so uh, but that's a, that's a case where, it's, you know, both a good thing and a bad thing. You pick all the right investments and then you just like, oh, it, it went up like 40 percent. I'll sell it. Right. And so it's, <laughs> you know, so it's kind of a funny story there. Uh, my my investing style rarely has like big massive like losses. Uh, just just the way that I diversify and the way that I kind of you know pick pretty stable companies. Um, but for example, you know a, a lot of my mistakes are more along lines of selling. I mean the same thing. I bought Microsoft pretty early. Uh, you know when it was in that kind of uh, you know languishing phase, well after the dot com bubble, uh, it was kind of unsuccessfully getting into mobile. You know, and it was just kind of people were like, oh, you know, what is what is what's going to happen with Windows as we shift towards these other platforms? Uh, and so but I bought it. I, it basically was a value stock in many metrics uh, and it went up dramatically and I sold it. And it's like I should have just let it go up like another 5x. Right. So and I eventually again, I got back in, but it was like a there's like a big gap in the middle that I could have just let it compound uh, more so than I did. Uh, there's another investment I made early on, Brookfield Infrastructure Partners. Uh, you know, they're a global infrastructure play. Uh, they own a lot of different uh, assets like ports or electrical transmission lines in different countries. Uh, and so that was one of the, the, you know, that was, I kind of fixed that issue that I had of selling things too early. So I kind of let that run for a decade. Uh, and so I let that one compound multiple times over. Whereas a lot of the, the ones I, a lot of my misses were buying things that kind of went sideways for three years when the market went up 50%. And it's kind of like, well, this, this thing ended up, you know, languishing. So I think, you know, even though I was younger and technology, uh, you know, knowledgeable, 
I, 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 I think one of my mistakes early on was, was being too cautious with the valuations I pay for high quality companies, either selling them too early or, or not buying some of the best companies and then instead buying things that just kind of, you know, did okay, but, you know, failed to keep up with some of the, say, the FANG names. So you were able to retire by the age of 33 because you clearly were making some very strategic moves with your investments. How, I mean, how did you go from your 20s where you were kind of paying off medical bills and dealing with, you know, supporting your family to being able to retire at 33, which I guess that, that would be so many people's dream? Mostly by by having that side work, right? So I, I because I, I had a hobby that I, I enjoyed a lot, that I could make money from, which is basically a, you're in the early phase. I had, you know, investing blogs that made a little bit of side income. Mm -hmm. Then in 2016, when I launched my website, Lynn Alden Investment Strategy, I focused on a, on a more serious research business. So that, that say, you know, uh, say high end retail investors could, could get, get a lot from as well as institutions read it. So large head funds subscribe mm -hmm. to it, uh, pensions subscribe to it. So it kind of covers that pretty broad range. And so that's been a very successful project. And that has, you know, be, but it's one of those things, it's, it's like it's like an overnight success, but it had like, say, a 10-year learning curve in front of it that people don't see, where you just kind of gain knowledge, you have like little side projects, uh, and then eventually you start your real thing. And it's like, okay, well, that that's, it seems like it happens quickly, but it's a lot of pieces came together leading up to that. And so that helped kind of accelerate my, you know, basically when you, uh, like a story I like to use is, for example, if you have a, if say you're making, uh, you know, 60000 and your expenses are forty thousand, mm -hmm. uh, then you can save twenty thousand a year. But if you can find a way to make another twenty thousand on the side, it only increases your income by one third. But if you then save all that money, if you keep your expenses the same, then you've doubled your savings. You doubled you, instead of saving twenty thousand a year, you can save that forty thousand a year. Uh, and so that's kind of the the math I used, mm -hmm. where I would I would increase my income by quite a bit, but but my expenses would only go up very marginally. And so that extra amount could just go into investments. And then, you know, we've had, we've had, you know, say five really good years of, of, of gains, uh, really 10 years. I mean, ever since the 2009 bottom, we pretty much, the market's been very strong. And so that, that combination has resulted in, you know, a, a big diversified pool of assets that allowed me to, you know, eventually leave my engineering job uh, and be more financially flexible. And I still continue to obviously to do the investment research side of things. Well, you're a prime example that the information's out there if you want it. So why don't you think more people, just like the average American, is engaged in investing as opposed to, I think, Pomp just recently tweeted or had on his show the statistic that like almost 80% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. They don't have enough to survive an emergency. I mean, the information clearly with, with the internet, YouTube, books, it's out there. Why aren't people diving into it? But we started to see it somewhat this past couple of years, right? So when, when retail investors poured into the market after the, the COVID crash and, and poured into Robinhood and bought the airlines and bought, mm -hmm. bought all the stocks like that. So actually, we've had an uptick in retail participation and investing. And of course, that can be dangerous because they can get into, you know, they can get into meme stocks that eventually crash. They can over leverage themselves, but they also learn uh, and they, you know, they, they have these shared resources, right? So there's, you know, like uh, I'm speaking to a certain audience, whereas like, you know, there will be someone in Gen Z on YouTube speaking to other Gen Z investors. Uh, mm -hmm. And so there, there are these kind of networks of, of they can actually be pretty sophisticated in some ways. You have that, that big spectrum of low information investors, and then some of them are actually pretty sophisticated. Uh, and so I, I think that's a good thing. You know, overall, it's, it's people have, you can only be an expert in so many areas. And it is a challenge that investing is kind of a, it's a complex subject. Mm -hmm. uh, and people only have so much time in the day. And so it's unfortunately not been something that we very we prioritized in school as much as we should have. So I think it really starts with that. Uh, but then from there, it just, you know, people have just kind of detached from it. And I don't really know the exact reasons why people don't focus on it enough. But I know, for example, that, you know, I've had to put a lot of time into it in order to, to learn it over time. And so, of course, that comes with certain sacrifices in other areas. I mean, I've, I've worked a, a ton over the past decade. I worked long hours. Uh, and so that, you know, that can obviously affect relationships. That can affect your your health in some ways. You have to kind of step back and say you can only work so much and you can only, you know, focus on so many different things. And so I think it is challenging that a lot of people just haven't had the time or haven't had the inclination to go into it. Whereas I think, you know, I like ideally more people would learn the basics at least and know about savings versus expenses, how to how to save it, how to have, say, you know, how to build wealth gradually. 
uh, rather than, you know, kind of, you know, not knowing how the stock market works and either speculating or avoiding it entirely yeah. and kind of have that middle of the road approach. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I mean, even my parents, they, they immigrated here. They always viewed the stock market as extremely risky and they thought it was more like gambling. And, um, you know, it's, it's sad to think that a lot of people don't take advantage of it, but it is really intimidating. And uh, I think you need to, you know, go out there and try to absorb as much knowledge from people like you as possible to really capitalize on some of the money that you you take home, which seems to be less and less these days. Um, so I want to kind of talk about that. Since you dove into that investment research, you sort of saw how the sausage is made almost. You pulled the veil back. Um, when did you start to feel like maybe fractional reserve banking, you know, wasn't the best thing for the monetary system or, um, you know, when you started to notice inflation. I mean, can you talk to me about your journey of just getting to the place where Bitcoin might seem like a seem to have a great value proposition for you? Uh, so a lot of it comes down to the fiscal situation. Uh, and I, the biggest inspiration uh, for me was Ray Dalio, uh, because he popularized the idea of the long term debt cycle, uh, which is basically that you go through these periods of, you know, the normal five to 10 year business cycle where you, you, you know, the market increases debt in the system. Uh, some of it's productive, but then towards the tail end of it, it starts to become unproductive and speculative. Uh, eventually, there's some sort of catalyst uh, that you know results in a deleveraging, uh, and so you, you reduce debt, you go into recession. Uh, but then policymakers come in, they cut interest rates, they do fiscal stimulus, and they kind of short circuit that deleveraging cycle. And so by the end of that cycle, when it starts to you know kind of go into the next positive cycle, you have a higher level of debt to GDP than the prior time, and interest rates are, are hit a lower high and a lower low than the previous time. And so when you string a bunch of those short-term business cycles together over multiple decades, you get higher and higher debt as a percentage of GDP, and you get lower and lower interest rates. And so what the long-term debt cycle kind of focuses us on is after enough of those, after a long enough timeline, eventually interest rates hit zero or even slightly below zero in some cases, while debt is extraordinarily high. And that that kind of, that that train has run its course. Uh, and so policymakers switch to other types of, of policies that can start with, the, uh, you know, creating new bank reserves to buy assets, uh, or then you can combine it with, with, you know, much larger fiscal stimulus than normal. So you put a lot of money into the economy. Uh, and so eventually what you do is you, 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 you devalue the currency which basically reduces the debt load as a percentage of GDP because you boost nominal GDP through inflation and growth while holding rates below the inflation rate. And so, you know, that, that's how they got out of the, the 30s and 40s trap, essentially. Uh, and so we're kind of going through that same cycle now. And but of course, if you're a bond holder or a cash holder, uh, you do very poorly in those types of decades. I mean, if, if you look at a long term chart of the interest, uh, the um the inflation adjusted ter returns you earn from buying and holding uh, 10 year treasuries, for example, you know, from the 30s all the way through the 70s, uh, you, you pretty much had negative real returns, inflation adjusted returns on those assets during that that time. There was like a brief window in the, in say, the, the, the 50s and early 60s where you could make a small positive return. But for most of that, that 40 year period, they were just money losing. Uh, you know, uh, assets, whereas, you know, they've been very strong from the early 80s all the way into the, the 2010s. Uh, but it seems like we're kind of gearing up towards another one of those periods of just treasury yields being below the inflation rate, failing to keep up with that because of where we are, how much debt there is in the system, policymakers don't have a lot of room. And so I basically started incorporating macro into my stock selection process uh, pretty early on. I mean, it's especially, you know, coming of age during the a great financial crisis, uh, you know, naturally made me somewhat macro aware. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I would, I, I kind of gradually added to it, learned to it. And so in, in addition to learning about stock investing, I'm also look, you know, learning about macro and, and some of the, the, you know, the investing legends over the past several decades that have, you know, had a lot to teach about that. So Stanley Druckenmiller, mm -hmm. Ray Dalio, investors like that, that I could learn from and, and kind of incorporate it into my uh, stock analysis. And so, you know, because, Precious metals are one of my first investments. That's always been an area that I've I've been pretty knowledgeable on, that I followed pretty closely, and so that that naturally you know can lead to cryptocurrency uh, after a certain point, uh, and so I got interested in that. And a funny thing is, I mean, you know, even though I had a, a technical background, it's like we were talking about before about missed opportunities with investing. I mean, I heard about I had a friend that was like mining Bitcoin on her computer back when you you just needed a high end graphics card to do it, and 
And I was like, that sounds neat. Like maybe I should do that. And I was like, maybe next weekend. I just never got, it was like, it was kind of hard and I was busy with all the other stuff I mentioned, right? So I was working, I was, and I was like, yeah, I just didn't get to it. And then of course, like, you know, that was like a, you know, a hundred million dollar missed opportunity if you just had been someone who, you know, did that. But again, I, even if I did that, I probably would have then sold them when they tripled, mm -hmm. right? That That's the classic. So people think, you know, if, if only I had bought Bitcoin when it was a dollar, well, it's like, yeah, you would have sold it when it was $5, right? <laughs> Most likely. Uh, totally. And so, you know, so I, I had a couple of different points where I would, I would come into contact with Bitcoin. Uh, but it's, you know, it's after I kind of, you know, saw it go through enough cycles, eventually I started paying attention to it more when it became large enough that it was kind of on my radar as a macro asset. And so I started kind of treating it in the same way that I treat, let's say, precious metals, where I'm viewing it as a commodity that I'm also, you know, incorporating into a portfolio. Well, before we transition to talking all about Bitcoin, um, I just want to talk about sort of where you see the next five years happening with the market. I mean, it sounds like you're one of the people that agrees that we're probably headed for another potentially major crash. Um, some of the macro strategists that I follow, they're predicting a crash that rivals potentially even the Great Depression because all of this debt just needs to really shake out um, and that pre precious metals will soar. Um, hopefully it would you know, make Bitcoin soar. What, what are your thoughts on it in the future? And also potentially even um, you know, how it would affect the dollar? So it, that, it depends on the roadmap that policymakers take. And so one of the challenges of being in a macro heavy environment is that a lot uh, depends on what policymakers decide to do. Whereas if you're in an environment where it's not a macro heavy environment, it's more about the bottom up fundamentals. Uh, and so, you know, I think for most of this decade, we're gonna look back and see that this was a rather inflationary decade. You know, maybe not every year was inflationary, but overall it was more inflationary than the 2010s. Uh, and that interest rates spent most of their time below the inflation rate. So if you were holding cash in a bank, if you were holding treasuries, uh, you're probably going to get devalued over the course of this decade, maybe not in straight line, uh, but that those will, in hindsight, not have been very good investments, whereas real assets, I think, will generally hold up better. Now, you know, for, for the risk of a crash, you know, there, there are certain, say, steps that policymakers could make, like if they were to try to tighten in a similar way that they tried tightening in, say, 2018, 2019, right? So, I mean, 2017, 2018, leading up to that, you know, kind of big dip we had uh, in late 2018, you know, I think we could have another event like that where, you know, inflation starts to run hot. The Fed says, OK, now we, we can't keep calling it transfer. Right, we have right. to start kind of uh, tapering and then you could get the market freak out. Uh, and so in general, I would be buyers of those types of, of, of corrections, crashes. Uh, so I have generally a, a pro inflationary, pro asset point of view for the decade, but I'm not leveraged to that idea. Right. So if we have these pullbacks, I have, say, you know, money set aside and some cash or, or tips they could say rotate into some of those, uh, you know, uh, periods of weakness. Uh, and so, you know, I can, I can certainly envision scenarios where you get a big, say, deflationary crash. Uh, but I think that because, you know, the, say the government balance sheet is so leveraged, uh, I think, you know, that uh, much like a lot of these uh, kind of corrections we've had over the past several years, I think it'd be somewhat brief in the sense that, you know, policymakers would probably rush in, devalue the currency more, and try to prop that up again. As for the dollar, I mean, if they try to taper, uh, then they risk the dollar spiking and you have a kind of a, that's kind of what happened in March, 2020, where then the foreign sector might have to sell some assets in order to get dollars, right? And that can negatively affect uh, U.S. assets. And so we're in an environment now where because the United States uh, net international investment position is so low, meaning that foreigners own a very large percentage of our assets, it's very hard for the dollar to go up strongly and for asset prices to also go up strongly. We've had a, you know, over the past three to five years, you've had a pretty strong inverse correlation there. Uh, and so I think that, you know, that's kind of a, uh, a headwind that could that could face markets. Uh, but I think that overall, when we look back again from like towards the end of this decade, I think there will probably be a dollar bearish environment because I think the United States is probably going to increase its, its money supply at a faster rate than other, other developed countries. That's what we saw over the past two years since, since say COVID. Uh, and so I think that's set to continue with the U.S. probably having somewhat higher inflation rates than Europe or Japan and, you know, holding its rates at a similarly low level. And so we end up with, a, you know, more negative real rates than some of those other countries. But overall, I think the story of this decade will be that most fiat currencies devalue versus versus hard assets. Well, again, I think that's a great value proposition for Bitcoin, right? So you shared that you discovered it early and you um, didn't take advantage of being able to mine it at that point. But so tell me about the transition that happened where all of a sudden you said, actually, Bitcoin's something that I'm going to take a look at and invest in. 
Yeah, so I mean, the first phase was that really early on one where I, I, I got an idea of how the technology works. I thought the technology was great. And I was like, I have no idea how to value that, right? And especially because we're talking back then, it's a very tiny asset. Yeah. And so I was like, that's neat, but you know, I'm not like a cypherpunk. And so I'll, I'll yeah. Yeah, like, you know, good luck guys. And then, so I just kind of ignored it for a while. Uh, you know, I had all this, I, I had, you know, health issues. I was, was like, you know, uh, doing financial support. I was working, I was, you know, it's just kind of like you lose track of things. And eventually when, when Bitcoin goes through those big bull runs, it captures media attention, draws people back in. Uh, and so, you know, during the 2017 bull run, naturally I had readers come out to me and say, what do you think about Bitcoin? Should I invest in Bitcoin? And I was like, okay, I clearly have to revisit this now. It's a much bigger asset. And so I did a report on it. It was towards the, it was towards like November of that 2017 bull run. And I said, again, I like the technology. It looks really interesting. Uh, here's a couple of different ways to value it. And my overall conclusion, I had, I had kind of two concerns with it. One was obviously that I'd already had a massive price run up. So I was like, it's, it's a very euphoric market. Uh, that concerns me. And then two, I was worried about dilution, right? So that was kind of the, 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 the one of the worst moments for say Bitcoin dominance, right? So you had the rise of of the, all these other tokens, uh, you had Bitcoin Cash splitting out of Bitcoin, uh, and I was like, so you know, even though say Bitcoin's scarce, what if the market just distributes into all these these tons of, of tokens? Uh, you know, how can I say which one's going to do well over a given period of time? And so I said, you know, at this current time, I'm going to go ahead and pass again, and that ended up being the right decision because you had a blow off top, and then you had a crash, and then you had a consolidation that lasted a few years. And so it actually, it underperformed many other asset classes from that point. But I kept watching the space. I mean, I didn't have like my opinion set in stone and I saw some of those concerns answered. So obviously the, the crash and the consolidation took away the price euphoria. Uh, and then the, you know, we started to see that, that the network effect of Bitcoin in particular strengthened, right? So, so Bitcoin Cash and these other hard forks kind of failed to capture any meaningful percentage of the market uh, share. Uh, and we started to see, you know, stronger and stronger network effects arise around uh, Bitcoin and then Ethereum as well, but basically only those two kind of achieved a certain level of critical mass that the, that the long tail of, of other tokens didn't get. Uh, I started to see, you know, the groundwork being laid for institutional adoption, right? So we started to see places like Fidelity kind of roll out these uh, custody solutions that larger pools of capital could get into. Uh, and so I was kind of watching it for a while. And then in early 2020, when, when we had the, the COVID crash, I, I saw, I was closely watching precious metals because uh, I knew that there's gonna be a lot of fiscal stimulus coming out, out of this. And of, and of course, during the heart of the crash, you had gold go down, you had silver go down even more. I mean, silver crash. And so that was like a buying opportunity of a lifetime. But I also saw that Bitcoin and other cryptos were doing the same thing. And they were, they were acting just like precious metals. And so on the upswing in April, I was like, okay, now I'm in, I'm in, I'm in Bitcoin. And so I recommended it uh, to my research uh, subscribers when it was like 7,000 uh, mm -hmm. in April, 2020. And, you know, then it was like, it wasn't say go all in on Bitcoin. It's, hey, I'm going to start including Bitcoin in my portfolio. I think it's actually really well positioned here. I started reading more about it. I, I kind of learned more details of, of the algorithm, right? So I went into a, a greater technical depth than I did with my prior analysis. Uh, I started, you know, just, just kind of researching it from a bunch of different angles, uh, going into specifics of how Bitcoin's different than all these other tokens that are at a more complete level than I had before. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I kind of started building my overall investment thesis. Uh, and eventually, you know, during that kind of mid-2020 period, I, I, I allocated it pretty heavily because I was looking at, say, that the, the halving cycle it goes through. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, and so I kind of just said, okay, the macro environment combined with, you know, the network effects that build up, combined with the, you know, it's, it's, it's long consolidation. Uh, and so I basically had a, a pretty high conviction uh, view that it would do pretty well going into, say, 2021. And so I've been, I've been pretty much bullish ever since, uh, you know, during the, the mania earlier this year, uh, when, you know, every, every cryptocurrency under the sun was going like vertical, uh, I started to say, okay, I'm still structurally bullish here, but it is the whole space is getting frothy. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, you know, you know, basically make sure you have risk management and price. That that obviously means different things to different people. It means, you know, it's not a good not a good time to be leveraged to it, not a good time to to be shocked if you see it go down. Mm -hmm. um, so this has been a larger correction than I was maybe expecting, but overall it's it's been an environment that's done very, very well uh, for that asset. So did discovering Bitcoin make you think differently about economics? Like, did you read Seyfedean's book and maybe explore Keynesian versus Austrian economics more? And off of that, did you see Bitcoin as a future currency, a future, you know, store of value, a global reserve asset, or, or just something to expose yourself in your portfolio? 
Well, so a lot of people kind of explore economics through Bitcoin, whereas, you know, from my end, because I was already focused on macro pretty heavily, I already, I already was familiar with all those different schools of economic thought. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, I don't, I don't go into some of, their, some of the individual ones as, as deep as, as specialists do in those areas, right? So I can't say, quote, some of the people, in, you know, the thinkers in that space the way that, you know, uh, you say Safedine can, uh, for example. But, you know, I was familiar with all the different schools of, of economics and, and, you know, how I, I use different pieces of them to kind of interpret data that's happening in the economy. Uh, and so it hasn't really changed my outlook too much because I, I, again, I partially came from a precious metals background from a young age. And so I already, already kind of had that, you know, uh, uh, view that, you know, I was never, ever since I was a kid, I was just was never super into fiat currency. I was like, we literally have these pieces of paper yeah. that have no value, but, but people think they have value. And so ever since a young age, I was like, well, I want to store most of my assets, not in paper. I want to store it in stocks. I want to store it in precious metals. I want to store it in real estate, whatever the case may be. And so this to me was like another asset that I could add to my arsenal to do that with. Uh, but one that I thought had you know, one of the better opportunities for long-term growth and, and capturing market share from other types of assets because it's a global distributed, uh, you know, protocol that, you know, even people in emerging markets that have a smartphone, but they don't have access to stocks in the same way, well, they can still buy some Bitcoin. Uh, and we see overall that it's just in many ways, you know, a technology that that adds a lot of value, right? So it's a, it's a permissionless decentralized ledger. Uh, and so I said, okay, I think, you know, kind of combining the idea of gold with a tech stock, uh, I think this can do very, very well. And le learning from my prior experiences of say selling Adobe or Microsoft too early than having to buy back in at a higher price, uh, I, I said, okay, well, uh, I'm not gonna make that mistake with Bitcoin, right? So uh, I'm not gonna say buy so much that I'm worried about say 50% drawdowns. Uh, and I'm just gonna buy an amount that I think is appropriate for my risk tolerance, which, which for me was pretty high because I did a lot of research on it. Uh, and I said, I'm just going to let this run for years and let that segment of the portfolio do whatever it wants, because if I'm wrong about that thesis and, and Bitcoin goes down, the loss of that investment is not going to change my financial life. On the other hand, if I'm if I'm correct about that investment uh, and that goes up by uh, quite a bit, then that can that can add meaningfully, uh, you know, to my portfolio gains. And so so far, it's it's been a wild ride, but it is up notably from my cost basis. And we'll see how that you know continues to go. But for me. I watch more than just price action. I watch the fundamentals, right? So I look at what's happening on the Lightning Network, for example. I look, I look what I've been following the the minor migration out of China and the distribution there. So I started incorporating, you know, looking into some of the finances of the public miners or the economics of of you know buying your own miner, for example, and kind of going into all those different avenues. And so it is basically it's a subject that, you know, there's only so much that can be said about gold. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and but whereas Bitcoin, it's like you know you can always explore new avenues because it's it's always changing and growing and getting better over time. Well, going off that, Bitcoin is so nuanced, and I think that for the general public, especially when the price is so high, that's why I've heard a lot of people aren't going in. They just think it's too late, it's too expensive, it has that volatility. So I don't know if you could if you had like an international platform where you just you were going to be on a commercial for I don't know a minute, and everyone in the world was going to watch it with you know general finance backgrounds or no finance backgrounds. What would you tell people about Bitcoin? What would you want them to know? I would show them the logarithmic price chart. I think I think it's one of those things where a, a visual is worth a thousand words. And so I would just basically show the logarithmic price chart and say, look, it's had multiple bubbles uh, where it's, it's been a mania. It's gone up, you know, 10x in a short period of time and then it's collapsed in price and then it's kind of consolidated. And I would say every single time this happens, people think they're too late. Uh, like I thought I was, you know, I was looking at Bitcoin, you know, at, at say 10,000. In 2017, I was like, "This is already this is this is a you know a very big asset already, right?" And so, you know, until that cooled off a lot, I didn't really want to get into it. And I'd say, "Look, if you you know, my argument for a while has been that you don't have to be all in on Bitcoin. It's just I think it's time where it's it's proven itself enough that a non-zero position is is appropriate for most people. Uh, and so you can bet a couple percentage of a portfolio on it, for example, and at least have exposure to it. And that'll make you learn more about it because you're now you're kind of watching the price more and you want to learn more about it. And then you can you can dial that up if you have higher conviction, if you learn more about it. And so basically, I would just show that logarithmic price chart. I would say, you know, uh, uh, I would kind of list all the advantages of it. Basically, it's a, it's a it's a network that, you know, anyone can access. Anyone with a basic Internet connection can access uh, that they, you know, they have the ability to self-custody a bare asset. 
that they can send permissionless payments to people. Uh, and so they can kind of take control over part of their financial life that may maybe in, in many markets people couldn't do before, right? So there are only, only so many tools available to them to save money. And then when you add to it the fact that, you know, even separate from the asset, Bitcoin is a monetary network. And so we're seeing things with like, say, the Strike app and the overall Lightning network. Uh, we're seeing that it, it can become a foundation for many types of other things as well. We can see stable coins potentially run on it. We can see smart contracts run on it. We can see, uh, you know, fiat to Bitcoin and back to fiat payments. So international payments using Bitcoin rails. They're basically, you know, there's a, a really kind of, you know, big spectrum of things that you can do with this technology because every day you have thousands and thousands of developers working on making it better. Uh, so it's kind of like that, that combination of gold and a growth stock. Totally. Well, you mentioned that you didn't expect this correction to last as long as it is. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I know there are a lot of people out there that are really frustrated, right, at the sideways um, chart action, the price action, and they're just wondering when the momentum is going to come back in and what it's going to take. So what are your thoughts on the volatility and the, the drawdown? So overall, I mean, I think grayscale was a large part of it. And it's not their fault. It's basically just the structure of how it works. So basically, in addition to the normal demand for Bitcoin, there was also demand for that neutral arbitrage trade where you could you could buy grayscale at, you know, that's the grayscale Bitcoin trust. So it's one of the publicly traded vehicles that people can access Bitcoin with. And generally, those shares trade at a premium. So if, if Bitcoin, you know, for every dollar worth of Bitcoin the trust holds, the trust might trade at $1.25, right? So you're paying it, you basically, you're paying a 25% markup. And that, that changes over time. But the way that works is that, you know, accredited investors could buy into that fund at NAV. So they basically would get Bitcoins, put it into the fund. They could buy the, the shares at, at net asset value. And the only catch was they couldn't sell it for six months. They had to hold it for six months. And after the six months ends, they can then sell those shares, uh, including for whatever premium that they're currently trading at. So an, a, a neutral arbitrage trade, uh, a sophisticated investor could say, I don't know what Bitcoin's going to do, but I can buy into this Grayscale Bitcoin Trust uh, at uh, you know at NAV, and then I can short an equal amount of Bitcoin. And after six months, I can, I can close those trades and sell the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust at public prices for, say, a 25% markup and just kind of capture that spread. And they can do that twice a year. And the way that works is that, you know, uh, because Grayscale is not redeemable, Bitcoins flow into Grayscale, but they never come out except for uh, paying its expense ratio, which is very small. Uh, and so that's kind of a one directional thing that kind of pulled Bitcoin off of exchanges and into cold storage. Uh, and so that was that, you know, for, for the second half of 2020, Grayscale was the biggest buyer of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And so, again, some of that was natural demand. People wanted to own Bitcoin through that fund, but also, uh, you know, some percentage of that was the neutral arbitrage trade. Uh, and so eventually, because of the rise of competition, other types of funds, Grayscale's premium went away. Uh, and so there's no reason to do that trade anymore. And so there's still natural demand for Bitcoin, but that neutral arbitrage trade went away. And so, of course, when you have that, you know, that we also had a mania that I started to get concerned by and say, February, March, April, May of, of this year, where every every token under the sun was going straight up, right? So uh, even some of the, the ones that are made as jokes or that have poor fundamentals, they have no development work really happening on them. Uh, you know, they're, some of them are, are clear scams. Uh, some of them are like offshoots, so like kind of like a niche kind of un, undeveloped offshoots of other tokens. Uh, and those are going like up like 5X in a month. Uh, and so... It's, it's one of those things where, you know, uh, it's a shame that so many people kind of piled into some of the projects that are not, not really worth anything. Because, of course, when you have the drawdown, a lot of them, you know, even though they went up really fast, people that bought into that mania, they, they get pulled down uh, by buying into the wrong token projects. And so I think it's over time that, you know, it's natural that we're, you know, the, the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust is unwinding. So that's behind us now. Uh, we had to clear out a lot of this malinvestment, a lot of this, uh, you know, kind of people pulling into the wrong types of tokens. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's most indicators show that the market, the Bitcoin market never got as hot as it did in, say, 2017 or 2013 uh, or 2011, for example. And so that's one reason why I wasn't expecting it to, say, go down as hard as it did yet, because it wasn't as hot as those previous times. Uh, but it makes sense given how much speculation there was in the space uh, and with that grayscale uh, uh, trust arbing away. And so I think overall now it's kind of this consolidation phase. We're starting to see signs that, that, that the coins are flowing back into the strong hands, right? So a lot of the people that say bought in at, at the top then sold at a loss, uh, and the people that are say dollar cost averaging into it or institutions that are saying, okay, here's my opportunity to 
buy Bitcoin, whereas you know a lot of them are maybe looking at Bitcoin, thinking about buying it, but went up really fast, like, oh, we missed it. Well, then when it crashes, they're like, okay, now we can actually start kind of allocating to it and getting that process in place. And so we are starting to see kind of a rotation back into strong hands. And I think it's one of those things where that kind of, you know, it, it could take a while, but that sets the foundation for the next bull run because it means that, you know, coins are coming off of exchanges, coins are going into cold storage, and there's only so much supply available. So eventually that, that starts putting a price floor and pushing it up over time. Are you a subscriber to the stock to flow model? And do you think we will get, you know, the high price that that predicts for potentially the end of this year? So not precisely. I, I found that the, the, the stock to flow model charts that plan B put together were, were very useful for understanding Bitcoin's price history. So, uh, you know, those types of charts are what helped me kind of start looking at Bitcoin in logarithmic terms, mm -hmm. uh, seeing how that the halving cycle fits into those price rises. So they were actually, you know, I, I found that the, that the content he produces is very useful. Uh, but I've never been one to say, I think that, that, you know, that, that I, I agree necessarily uh, with the, the, the target price. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying it's, you know, it's, it's not a, it, it's not a price target that I necessarily agree with. Uh, and so, you know, I'm not kind of tied to that, what, what, what the, the model says the price will be, but I do think that that sort of those charts and, and that kind of way of thinking about it is pretty informative. So eventually as, as Bitcoin's inflation rate keeps going down, in other words, it's, it's, it's flow to stock ratio keeps decreasing or stock to flow ratio keeps increasing. Uh, that does eventually, you know, basically make it a harder and harder form of money. And it makes it so that anyone who wants to buy into the network, instead of buying into new coins, they have to be able to get existing coins from someone else because there's not that many new coins being generated. And so that can, you know, push the price up until Bitcoin eventually reaches whatever steady state it's going to reach, whenever it kind of reaches its, its you, know, you know, the closer end of its total addressable market capitalization. Uh, and so, I, again, I think they're informative charts. I just don't necessarily subscribe to a specific price model. Got it. So if you had to guess, what would the price be at the end of this year and let's say in five years? I mean, so that's challenging. One of the, one of the ways I like to model it is as a percentage of estimated gold market capitalization. Uh, and because it's, it's kind of competing in that market, but it also potentially can go bigger than that market because it has more use cases. And so most estimates show that, you know, gold's estimated market cap is somewhere around say 12 trillion dollars of which four or five trillion is used for for say specific purpose of investment by private citizens and institutions uh, and so i think you know over the very long run bitcoin could easily reach half the market capitalization of gold maybe the full market capitalization of gold and there are you know there are very bullish scenarios that can go above that because it can be used for things that gold can't be used for potentially and so I, you know, I think that over the multi, you know, year long run, I, I, I have a, you know, target of at least uh, several trillion dollars in market capitalization. Uh, and it's, I think there's a really big range for what that'll be, right? Because we're, it's this new technology, we're exploring how big it can get, we're exploring how many problems it can solve. Uh, now for the next six months, for the rest of the year, I don't have a strong outlook. Uh, I'm watching to see if it holds this this 30,000 price level, you know, more or less. It can it can dip low for periods of time. I'm going to see if it can hold that level. Uh, and I have certain kind of price levels that I'm watching for kind of confirmation of the renewed bull run. So if it starts to break over, say, 42,000 reliably, uh, that'd be really good signs that the bull market's back on. And so I'm just going to be watching these on-chain indicators. I, I think, you know, going into 2022, uh, I'd be pretty bullish on it, but you know, six months is a pretty close timeline. So it's hard to say. Again, that's that's predicting what other people would do. So it's predicting other people's emotions. Uh, but overall, what I'm watch watching pretty heavily is the fundamentals. So things like what what's happening in the Lightning Network. That's probably one of the things I'm watching closely. Uh, I've also been exploring Bitcoin mining, right? Mm -hmm. So there are services now, like say Compass, where you can buy a Bitcoin miner. And you own it. It's not like you're. It's not like a cloud service. You own the miner, but you can then host it in in, in a facility that they, you know, have a marketplace for. Uh, and so I'm I'm basically using the hosting as a service for my the Bitcoin miner that I own. And when you kind of go into the economics of say how much Bitcoin a miner can generate versus how much cost you pay in electricity, how much the miner costs, uh, I think that's another interesting way to dollar cost cost average in a Bitcoin because you buy a miner and then let it run for a few years and you end up, you know, with a, a a pretty good return on investment, assuming Bitcoin, say, you know, chops long sideways or goes up over that over that period. Gotcha. Well, I noticed you didn't actually give a price, but uh, I'll let that go. Um, uh, as far as just threats to Bitcoin, is there anything that you see that could potentially take it to zero? Um, so, you know, basically some sort of security flaw could take it to zero, right? So, I mean, 
in a, in a classic sense, I mean, there are people that are that'll never sell their their coins and they're willing to buy it. So that kind of you know makes a floor for how low it can go, right? So the joke is if 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 Bitcoin goes below a certain price, I'll buy all of Bitcoin, right? So it can't, literally can't go to zero unless, of course, uh, you know, something breaks the chain. So something, some sort of, you know, uh, persistent, say, 51% attack that can't be addressed or other sort of security issue, maybe some sort of massive bug that, that say, you know, results in an unattended fork and breaks the community. You know, there, there are kind of tail risks I can imagine that could break it. Uh, I think another big risk would be some sort of coordinated draconian ban against it. Uh, and so that'd be, you know, there's some precedent in, say, American history of, of gold being illegal for Americans to own for 40 years, which is kind of funny when you think about a free country and you can't own a benign metal, right, so, because it's, it's too much of a threat. Uh, and so, you know, in, in jurisdictions that have big property rights, right, so rule of law, I, I generally find outright ban to be unlikely. We've even, see, we've even seen some emerging markets move to ban it and then kind of pull back and say, well, maybe not. Maybe actually we don't want to ban ourselves from this network. Uh, and so we kind of revisit that. But I think if you were to have, say, co a coordinated ban where, uh, you know, U.S. financial institutions are not allowed to connect to the Bitcoin network, European financial institutions are not, not allowed to connect to it. We're already seeing that out, out of China. Uh, if you were to have that all kind of happen, that could really keep the price low for many, many, many years. Uh, and so I don't know if that, that I don't think that'd be enough to push it to zero, but that would be one of the most damaging cases from an investment standpoint. And I think, you know, eventually it could, it could still potentially even win against that scenario. Because uh, it's like one of those things where countries that move to ban hard assets are generally the types of environments where you end up wanting to own a hard assets when right. you look back several years, right? So they don't ban those assets when things are going good for their currencies, right? So I think, you know, Bitcoin could eventually make a comeback, but that would be one of the major tail risks that could, you know, that could that could bring it, you know, that could bring it down in price considerably. So I would say that, you know, for it to actually go to zero, it would take some sort of major security flaw probably to, to bring it all the way down. Really interesting. Well, I'm going to start to wrap up here, and I want to ask you a more philosophical question. Um, there are a lot of the big, big Bitcoiners out there that talk about just the hope that Bitcoin could provide uh, to fix problems like wealth inequality, um, and even you know that trickles down to things like homelessness and just poverty. Do you have any thoughts on that? Like, do you see Bitcoin as potentially being um, a fix for some of the things that increasingly plague societies across the world, but for sure here in America? Yeah, we're seeing it in a couple of different places. So I think it's, you know, I I think it's concerning when people think that it'll solve everything, right? So you know, they get their hopes up that it'll fix everything, and you know, uh, and so I don't I don't view it as being able to fix everything, but I think it's a powerful tool that societies have to fix a lot of issues. And so, for example, in emerging markets, developing markets, frontier markets, uh, it can be hard to have property rights, right, or to have some sort of wealth that you can bring with you if you move around. Uh, you know, so your your access to you know, build build wealth outside of a devaluing currency is, is very hard. And so, you know, smartphones are are basically becoming so cheap and so widespread that, you know, even in those markets, the, the adoption rate is starting to go up pretty dramatically. And so that gives more and more people access to, to, to Bitcoin, to basically a scarce asset that is protection from their local devaluation. And then if they ever have to flee their area, uh, which as Americans is not something we think about very often, uh, but it's happened in Europe. It's happened in in many countries around the world where people have to flee their country, and they can bring those assets with them with them. Uh, and so I think that's a huge tool. We also see, for example, uh, Russia's opposition leader. Uh, you know, their banks are often cut off. Uh, you know, and and so, but they can still accept Bitcoin, and they, they've actually been doing that. Uh, Reuters reported on that uh, quite a bit. That you know, they're they're relying on Bitcoin as kind of their insurance, where you know, if, if the other payment methods fail, people can still send over Bitcoin. Uh, and so we are starting to see it solve these these actual problems. And, and El Salvador is another example where you have low banking rates, you have you have all sorts of inefficiencies in terms of remittances uh, and all these you know fees that they pay. And a, a basic lightning wallet is a way uh, to basically bank the unbanked uh, and also to make uh, payments cheaper uh, and to basically apply software to an analog problem. Uh, in developed markets, uh, you know, I think it's 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 less impactful for some developed markets than it is for some of those emerging markets. But over the long run, and again, it gives people a chance to save uh, in a way that they they might not have saved if they're only you know if they're mostly focusing on say fiat currencies that are you know the interest rates are below the inflation rate. Uh, and I think over time, it just kind of it decentralizes the system a little bit more. I, I think 
in many ways, people might end up being disappointed how far it can go, because I think that governments will still try to centralize certain things. Uh, and so, yeah, I think I have maybe expecting it to go less all the way than some of the really, uh, you know, the really bullish Bitcoiners. Uh, but I do think that it, it, it adds a lot of tools to the arsenal that people can have to protect themselves against all the things that, that these forces outside of their control uh, c can do to their money, to their, you know, to, to, you know, whatever their investments might be. That's really insightful. Well, looking back on your life, I mean, you've been poor, you've been rich. I read, you know, the difference in your vacations. You used to go to like motels and then all of a sudden you're in high class resorts in Hong Kong. Um, what's the big life takeaway when you look back on your life and your career? What was the biggest lesson? I think it's about pursuing your passion, right? So, I mean, if you find something you like working on, then it's not really work. Uh, and you basically turn your hobby into something that makes money uh, or that at least, you know, pays for itself, whatever the case may be. Uh, and so, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, money is important because it, it buys security uh, and it buys, uh, you know, freedom to some extent. But it doesn't it doesn't fix things. It doesn't fix poor health. It doesn't fix or I mean, unless unless it's specifically like you can't buy health insurance or something. But basically, you know, money doesn't mean much if you have poor relationships, if you're poor health, uh, if you you know, are always kind of wanting to catch up with your neighbor or, or are more focused on showing people that you have wealth rather than just, just being free, right? So I think when money is applied appropriately, it can, it can boost happiness. But I think people make the mistake of thinking, if only I had a certain amount of money, I'd be happy. And so really, you know, a lot of it comes from, I think, living simply, living healthy, uh, you know, trying to make the world a good place, and then have that habit of saving and investing so that you can, you know, Use, use the money to increase your freedom and security more so than, than say, materialism. And so on the, on the side, when there are certain things you want to explore that are, say, you know, expensive materially, that can be fine as long as you don't rely on them, you don't need them uh, in order to be happy. And it really about using, I think, money more productively. I love that. And just out of curiosity, are you still doing mixed martial arts? Uh, not anymore, not actively. That was something I, I did, uh, you know, when I started living with my father, uh, he, he put me in martial arts and, and I, it's, I never really had a talent for it at first, but I just stuck with it so long that I eventually got good at it. If you do something for 12 years, yeah. it's hard to be bad at it. And so that helped me, that helped me keep me in shape from a very young age. Uh, and so I, I, I still keep it up with, you know, uh, I, I go, I go running, I go biking, I go hiking, I, I go to the gym. Um, and so I still maintain that you know, that help that lifestyle. Uh, but I don't, I don't go and, and say, you know, uh, you know, full contact sparring anymore. <laughs> uh, I think I've had enough injuries from that. Well, I love it. You still have your warrior mind. So it's awesome. Um, final takeaway is just about Bitcoin. You want people to know. I think the, the takeaway is that fundamentals and price don't necessarily go together. Uh, and so if you focus on the fundamentals, I think that's more important than just focusing on price. So for me, my question is not not what is Bitcoin's price going to do in say a six month period. It's monitoring it to make sure that the network effects are are constantly getting better. So how how's how's Bitcoin's market share uh, doing? How you know what what's the current news in, in say uh, institutional adoption? What's happening with the Lightning Network? What's happening with mining? Uh, and so for me, it's it's about following the development that's happening on that protocol more so than following the price. And I think that, you know, ultimately, if you get the fundamentals right, price will follow. Uh, and of course, you can't predict when will price follow? Will it follow in three months? Will it follow in 18 months? It's hard to say. But if you if you if as long as you're paying attention to the direction of the fundamentals, then just like with a stock, eventually the, the price should follow. Interesting. And si side note, I love your voice. <laughs> I've always, I grew up with such like a, a Mickey Mouse voice, and I've always wanted more gravitas. And when I listen to people like you, I'm like, oh, a voice like that <laughs> do do people comment about your voice a lot uh yeah i see it a lot yeah it's it's one of those things where you know um uh yeah i, I mean people yeah it's one of those things like i'm self-conscious about it sometimes but at the same time i, I do recognize that it's kind of unique and i love it you know i, I guess it kind of fits the the mma background and the love you know it. That, that that kind of you know it all goes together i would take it in a heartbeat um well thank you so much lynn um how can people find you and talk to us about your newsletter uh, so I'm at lindon.com. Uh, I have free articles. I also have a free newsletter. And then for people that want to go deeper, I have a low cost research service they can sign up to. Uh, and I'm active on Twitter at lindoncontact. So I post charts and other kind of, you know, uh, free insights there.